Have you ever made a bowl of soup and then took a sip to see how it was? Well, you sampled the soup. Let's learn how to do that. Same thing with research. Ba -da -da -da. Welcome to another journey with Chris where we will obtain new levels of knowledge and awesomeness. Hello scholars, today we're going to journey through quantitative sampling. On our journey we're going to cover two types of sampling, probability and non-probability. Before we begin, we need to define a bunch of words. The first is population. This is the group of people you're interested in studying. The next is parameter. This is a description of a certain variable regarding the population. So, let's say that a researcher had a research question of what percent of Greek college students, that's fraternities and sororities, in the U.S. smoke cigarettes? Well, the population of this research question is all of the Greek college students in the United States. The parameter is the percent of them that smoke cigarettes. Okay, it would take a lot of time and money to locate, contact, and ask every single Greek student in the U.S. if they smoke cigarettes. So, what researchers do is use sampling and statistics to help them answer their research question without spending as much money and time. Okay, here's some more words you need to know. Sampling frame. This is a list of the entire population that you're interested in studying. Sample. A sample is a subset of people from the population and the sample comes from your sampling frame. The next is representative. This is when a sample has the same characteristics as the population that it was drawn from. Generalizable. This is the ability to generalize information to the population. I'll get more into that in a second. The next is statistic. This is a description of a certain variable regarding the sample. Sampling error. This is the difference between a statistic and a parameter. Okay, let's continue with our example. Let's say that we had a list of every Greek student in the United States. That's our sampling frame. Then we select a smaller number of students from that sampling frame who have characteristics that are representative of all the population of Greek students, like such as the same proportion of males and females of certain races, those in fraternities or sororities, I guess that's male or female, right? And smokers, non-smokers, and so on. Okay, so this is our sample. We survey them and find that 17% of the sample smoke cigarettes. The 17% is our statistic about the sample. Since the sample was representative of the population, we are logically able to generalize our statistic to all college students and say that 17% of all Greek students in the United States smoke cigarettes. However, let's say that someone actually took the time to survey the entire population of Greek college students and found that actually 20% smoke cigarettes, well, then my sampling error would be that 3% difference. It's important to, to note that a statistic is a description of the variable regarding a sample. Statistic, sample. And the parameter is a description of a certain variable regarding the population. Parameter, population. It's a good way to remember them. Parameter starts with a P, so does population. Statistic starts with an S, and so does the sample. Okay, so how do we go about getting a representative sample from a population? We do this through probability sampling. We're going to talk about four different kinds. The first is simple random sampling. This is when you assign a number to each person in the sampling frame. Then you generate a set of randomly picked numbers. This is usually done through a computer program. These numbers show who will be picked into the sample. The next is systematic sampling. This is when you have a sampling frame and you determine how large you want your sample to be. Then divide the number of people in the population by the number of people in the sample. This is called a sampling interval. The sampling interval is the number that is spaced between selecting people in the sampling frame. For example, let's say you have a population of 500 Greek members from a college in your sampling frame. You decide that you want a sample you want a sample of 50 Greek members. So take 500 in the population divided by 50 in your sample and you get a sampling interval of 10. So every 10th person on your um, sampling frame list gets included into the sample. The next is stratified sampling. This is when the population is separated into different groups or strata. Let's take the example of the Greek members. We could separate the Greek members into different strata of each fraternity and sorority on, on campus. Then 
we use either simple random or systematic sampling to pick people from the sampling frame to make that sample. The advantage of stratified sampling is that it ensures that small subgroups or strata in the sampling frame are included in the sample. Let's say that there's only six people in one of the, fr in one of the fraternities. Stratified sampling makes sure that that small fraternity is included in the sample that people from that fraternity are included in the sample. The disadvantage of stratified sampling is that it can be hard to get a sampling frame that has enough information about each person so that the frame can be broken up into different strata. So stratified sampling is when sampling comes from distinct groups or strata that are broken up in the frame. Okay, cluster sampling. This is when it's impossible or very impractical to create a huge sampling frame such as creating a list of every single Greek college student in the entire nation. A way to simplify this is by first creating a sampling frame based from naturally formed groups which are called clusters. Then the clusters are sampled from that sampling frame. Then the people in those clusters are put into another sampling frame and then sampled by either simple random, systematic, or stratified sampling. For example, Greek students are naturally clustered by college. So instead of taking so much time to make a full list of every Greek student in the United States, let's make a list, a sampling frame, of every university that has a Greek population. That takes way less time. Then we can use, for example, simple random sampling to select a sample of those universities. Okay, so we have our sample of universities, which is our, which is our clusters. Then we can contact those universities and get a list of every Greek member at their school and put those Greek students into another sampling frame. This is a sampling frame of all the Greek students in those different clusters. And then we use simple random sampling to get a representative sample of student of those Greek students. So the advantage of cluster sampling is that it can save time creating a sample. The limitation, though, is that cluster sampling has two sampling errors. The first is from the sample of clusters. And then the second comes from the sample of people within those clusters. So we're, making, we're doing two, di two different samples. That's why we have two different sampling errors. Okay, finally, non-probability sampling. This is convenient sampling, which is what we talked about earlier in the semester. The advantage of a convenient sample is that it's convenient. We just sample people who are around us that are very convenient to include into a sample. But it's limited because it's obviously not representative of the population of interest. Therefore, the statistics from a convenient sample cannot be generalized. They're not generalizable to the entire population. In conclusion, there are four different probability samples that are representative and generalizable. Non-probability sampling, also known as convenient sampling, is not general generalizable. There are strengths and limitations to each type of sampling. Thanks for a great journey and we'll see you in class.